Well, good morning and welcome to the first press event of the day, our geoscience grab bag number three. With us today we have Riley Finnegan from the University of Utah talking about rock arches. And we have Matthew Wieliki from the University of Alabama who's going to talk about using geology to study kidney stones. I'm going to turn it right over to Riley to get us started. Hi, I'm Riley from the University of Utah, and I will be talking to you today about how different rock arches and towers vibrate in response to sound produced by helicopters. Our key findings from the study is that helicopters produce something called infrasound, which is really low frequency sound. They produce it, um, a, a common two-blade helicopter will produce infrasound at 13 hertz, which is far too low for a human to perceive, but we've measured quite, quite uh, high powers. So um, some of our recordings of helicopter infrasound are up to 100 decibels, which is like being at a live concert, but it's kind of weird because you cannot hear it because it's such a low frequency. This infrasound has been able to uh, cause different arches and towers to resonate at um, uh, uh, vibrations that are 100 times stronger than they typically do. And some studies have shown that uh, towers can vibrate at potentially damaging levels. Some of the determining factors for why a arch or tower might vibrate include um, or vibrate in increased levels to helicopter infrasound is uh, the size of the arch, the shape and the stiffness of the arch or the material makeup of it, as well as the distance, the speed and the number of blades of the helicopter. You might be asking, why should we care about arches and towers and why should we be concerned about helicopters? In Utah, arches are a very culturally valuable resource. We have over 6,000 documented around the state, an entire uh, national park dedicated to how great these features are. Additionally, uh, Native American groups in the Southwest Desert region consider arches sacred. And so we want to make sure that we aren't uh, inadvertently affecting the health of these really precious features. Helicopters, as I mentioned, uh, produce sound energy, and they can fly nearly anywhere, so the reach of their en energy is pretty much unlimited. Over the national parks in Utah, there are thousands of helicopter flights each year just for tourism, and the Grand Canyon sees hundreds per day. So this is really, helicopters fly everywhere pretty much all the time, and, and their sound is traveling with them. Our study was uh, flying helicopters at six different flights around Utah and measuring the vibration response of 11 different rock arches and towers to the helicopter sound energy. This is Little Egypt highlighted in orange on the map and it's a outcrop of some small towers called hoodoos and we measured the vibration response of six of those towers and then I've also highlighted arsenic arch in pink. I'll give an example of how an arch might vibrate more from uh, exposure to helicopter noise. Arsenic arch is, um, you can consider it kind of any, any arch, kind of like a guitar string. If you pl pluck the guitar string, it will vibrate at a certain frequency, so it'll produce a tone. That's something you hear. And it's the same thing with an arch. If you, uh, the, the earth is constantly plucking the, the arch, and so it's vibrating from energy within the earth and around the earth. And it naturally vibrates at 6 hertz, at 16 hertz, at 26 hertz, hertz and 36 hertz. And the animation is of the 26 hertz resonant mode of arsenic arch. And of course, this is an exaggeration. It's not actually shaking that much, but it gives you an idea for how it is shaking. Um, and this is happening every single second, every single day. And 26 hertz happens to coincide with one of the, uh, the frequencies of sound emitted by a helicopter. So helicopters emit, uh, like I said, a two-blade helicopter will commonly emit a frequency or sound at 13 hertz and then it has higher overtones such as uh, like at 26 hertz. And if you coincide the frequency of incoming energy with the natural frequency of an object, the object will often vibrate more. It's kind of like if you properly time your push of someone on a swing and so you, you have the right frequency of pushing the person on the swing, they will swing higher and higher. And that's the same idea. 
This is a vibration recording of arsenic art during a helicopter flight. So the top panel is the vibration velocity of the arch over time, and the bottom panel is a spectrogram of the vibrations as well over time. So spectrogram essentially shows you power, which is different colors, at uh, different frequencies, which is on the y-axis over time, on the x-axis. And as a reminder, this is a vibration recording, not a sound recording. We sped up the, the vibration recording 20 times, so it's something that you could hear, but um, just a, a reminder that it is vibration, it isn't an audio recording. And it's a, it's a little spooky, so we'll give it a proper listen. Um, you'll hear it get louder, the vibration's getting stronger as the helicopter approaches and as the helicopter flies over. So uh, we'll, we'll play it now. fun, kind of weird. <laughs> this is another example of, a, of an arch called Two Bridges. It's in Bryce Canyon National Park, and it naturally resonates at about 13 and a half hertz, which coincides with the lowest uh, frequency of sound emitted by the tourist helicopter that flies over the park um, up to thousands of times a year. So we scheduled just a standard tourist flight to happen over the park. And the closest that the helicopter ever gets to the bridge is 600 meters away. Yet we see an increase in the vibrations of 100 times, which is quite, um, quite a lot for being the helicopter being so far away. The amplifications um, don't reach something, a level that we, or the vibrations don't reach a level that we would consider instantaneously damaging. But um, it's, this is something that the helicopter might experience 100 times a year, like on a really gusty day. We'll give it a listen as well. As a reminder, that was a vibration recording also sped up 20 times. Squint Arch is the last example I'll work through. It also resonates around 13 hertz, and um, it's perfect for uh, increasing vibrations from, or having its vibrations increase from a helicopter. So we flew a helicopter um, in a bit more controlled way, uh, flying over it, as well as approaching the, the arch in incremental, um, in a stepwise manner. And so the first part of the vibration recording that you'll be listening to is during the flybys. And so the, the amplifications again spike, and then at the end, the helicopter is approaching the arch closer and closer, and you'll hear the, the amplifications, um, or the vibrations amplify more and more. So this arch reaches 0.1 millimeters per second, which is uh, an order of magnitude lower than what, again, we would consider instantaneously damaging. But this vibration is something that naturally the arch would experience maybe once in 100 years. And so it really is, is a concern still for um, the long-term effects that a helicopter flight would have on the health of this arch. This has also been sped up 20 times, um, and it is a vibration recording. tell you when I was in my office making this presentation and people were turning around all the time. What is that? <laughs> so the, the general takeaways from our study is that helicopters 
um, can cause arches and towers to shake stronger than they typically do. And that our tests uh, specifically have not uh, generated vibration levels that we would consider instantaneously damaging, but the, uh, the long-term effects of helicopter flights um, is still a concern that we have for the, the general health of these really, really spe special features that we have. Thank you. That's not my first slide. Is it possible that that's not my first slide? Which is okay. Okay, yeah, he accidentally dropped the slides, so there you go. Great, thanks. Uh, my name is Matthew Wileke. I'm an assistant professor um, at the University of Alabama in the Department of Geological Sciences. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our work on kidney stones. Um, before I get into it, um, I'll address a concern or a question that many of you probably have already is what are earth scientists doing looking at kidney stones and getting involved in medical research. And to address that, I'd like to highlight these growth bands that you can see on this image here on this first slide. That's a kidney stone uh, for one, that was uh, reported on by one of our collaborators and co-authors on this research in an in a article written last year. And I just want to highlight those growth bands that you can see on the outer edges of that. And those are very analogous to sedimentary bands in, some, in, in a strict stratigraphic package or in growth rings and any other sort of chemical mineral that grows in a whole host of geologic environments. And so what we're trying to do is use some of the tools that our scientists have developed over many decades as they analyze these types of mineral deposits that grow in nature and use this toolkit to investigate human kidney stones as a, in fact, they are stones. So we can use a lot of the same types of techniques that we use for natural geologic samples um, to investigate these human kidney stones. In particular, what we're gonna do is uh, apply some um, novel techniques like uh, atom probe tomography. This is the first time any atom probe tomography has been done. I'll explain that technique in a second. I'm just highlighting the data set right here that I'll explain to you in a second, as well as transmission electron microscopy. And before I get into um, both of those techniques and what those are telling us, I just wanted to, oh, show you an image of our kidney stone that didn't load. Um, that's okay. You can kind of see in this broken image, hopefully we'll upload a better one um, that the media can use, but you can see in this upper portion that there are some of these growth bands. And that's what we're starting to investigate. So we're taking that, that kidney stone there that was provided to us from the Mayo Clinic, from a patient, um, and starting to work our way down into the atomic layer scale. So uh, I'll highlight some of these Scale bars here, you can see on the image on the middle left, there's a scale bar there that's 100 microns. That's about the width of a human hair, to put it into context. And so what we're doing is we're removing very, very tiny portions of this kidney stone so that we can start to investigate this material at the atomic scale. And so there's a lot of work that goes into just the sample preparation. Every material is unique and behaves differently. So there's been a lot of work that has gone into this, and there is going to be a lot of progress that's made as we learn how to uh, handle this material better. So here's some of the results. So this is the first atom probe tomography results on a human kidney stone. So atom probe tomography is a technique that allows us to essentially get some chemical information as well as information on where those atoms exist. So we can reconstruct a three-dimensional um, reconstruction of the chemistry of that object. And so what we're reconstructing here is our kidney stones. We're looking at things that are on the order of one one-thousandth the width of a human hair, hair. We get a mass spectrum so we know what the chemistry of the elements is, and we have some information about where the elements exist so we can reconstruct this. 
The transmission electron microscopy gives us chemical information as well. On the picture on the right, you can see an image that has of, of our kidney stone, and it's zoomed in, so that is a scale bar there of 300 nanometers. So we're talking on the order of one one-thousandth the width of a human hair. And we get some chemistry information. The overlay there is some of the uh, chemical um, constituents that we're interested in and how they vary on that, on that nanometer scale. And then we try to get some structural information from transmission electron microscopy as well. There's still a lot to do in this. This is very early results. We're not getting a lot of information on the structural side at the moment, likely because we still don't know exactly how to, to prep the sample so that it's um, uh, conducive to this type of technique, but we're, we're, we're still making some progress there. And why is this significant? So the significance of this research is that kidney stones affect about 9% of the U.S. population and about 12% of the world population. So that's nearly a billion people um, suffer from kidney stones. And currently, there's really no in vivo treatments. Um, the, the, the treatments for kidney stones currently are sonication and passing the stones or invasive surgery. And we think that if we can understand how these stones grow and are constructed on the atomic scale, that will be a foundation for developing in vivo treatments on how to deconstruct these stones within the kidneys and to promote a, an environment in the kidney that is conducive to resorption of the stone to uh, hopefully reduce the amount of invasive surgeries and, 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 and passing the stones. Um, so I'd love to take all the credit for this, but obviously this is a whole host of academic institutions and the Mayo Clinic that um, help us with this. Um, we have a poster um, tomorrow at 1.40, um, so please come by and see the poster if you're interested to get some more information. Thank you. Well, thank you to our panelists, and we can take a few questions from people in the room. We usually open it only to reporters, but well, let's go with Harvey first. Uh, Harvey Lyford, freelance. Although I once had a kidney stone, the question is for Riley. <laughs> uh, I was in Utah in September visiting Arches National Park and Bryce and others you mentioned. Uh, so I was really interested in this. Is the National Park Service concerned at all? Uh, are they aware of your research? Uh, has there been previous uh, suggestions that helicopters may be causing long-term damage? So the, was this for? Uh, the, the original question was posed by the Native American Consultation Committee, which is a consultative organization of six different Native American groups in the Southwest Desert region that partner with the National Park Service in managing Rainbow Bridge National Monument. So they, they pose this question of um, do multiple helicopter flights every single day um, over many years have, um, can, can that damage Rainbow Bridge National Monument? And so we took this question a little bit further of not just Rainbow Bridge, but can this affect other uh, rock features as well. And um, we don't, or I, I guess we, we have a permit to work in most of the national parks. However, our, our testing was done mostly um, on BLM land, uh, where I think the requirements for permits are a bit um, less. So uh, I'm, I'm sure they have similar concern. However, they don't manage the airspace above the national parks. Um, so. Larry? Yeah. Yeah, hi, I'm, just, I'm the social media guy for AGU, but I'm just very interested uh, in both. Uh, for the uh, Riley, um, is there anything that pilots can do? You mentioned certain frequencies that, that are particularly uh, affected, affect the uh, bridges and different things. Is there anything pilots can do to change the speed of their, their blades or anything? to mitigate this? So uh, helicopter rotors rotate at the same RPM. Um, that doesn't change. 
However, we learned that um, directionality is really important. Um, it depends on the feature, though. So some features might be um, relatively unaffected by horizontal incoming energy, whereas others might be um, unaffected by energy coming in at an angle. So it really just depends on the feature. And the other question I had regarding kidney stones is, was it difficult for you uh, to do this? Did you have to kind of come into it and not think about the medical side and just try to stay in the geological mindset when you did this? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So we're, we're, we're definitely approaching this from a thermodynamic standpoint and stability of a mineral, just like we would in a geologic environment and kind of removing ourselves from the medical side. Um, eventually, we're gonna, the, the goal would be to merge those two, um, to start thinking about certain conditions that are more conducive to kidney stones like diabetes and other metabolic disorders. Um, but currently, we're just trying to really understand the, the physics behind how these things grow and the chemistry, and then we can start approaching, kind of bringing in more information like medical history and things like that. Just checking if we have any questions online for a moment. Um, Catherine Wright of Physics Magazine has a question for Riley. Um, she wants to know, how did you pick the 11 arches that you studied? We study a range of arches of different sizes and shapes and in different locations, and um, maybe a, f a few dozen at this point we have measured the resonant frequencies of. Um, and so we chose ones that had natural frequencies that would um, likely coincide with the, the sound emitted or the, the frequency of sound emitted by helicopters for these particular tests. Any further questions from the room? All right, I'm gonna thank our panelists, and we're resuming with the Parker Soil Probe at 10 a.m. <laughs>